Professor. Okay, I'm going. We're going to go live. And you can go ahead and say good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Praxis 10 Plus seminar. My name is Denise Morado, and I am a professor at the School of Architecture in the Federal University of Minas Gerais, and I coordinate practice our research group. It is a great pleasure to welcome you to the last day of our seminar. I would like to state our gratitude that I expressed on the very first day of our seminar. And I'd like to start with the Institute of Architecture and Urbanism, also San Diego State University, and also the translators, Jogo Saraiva and Simone de Lima, I'd like to thank the Federal University of Minas Gerais, the Graduate Program in Architecture and Urbanism, the Brazilian National Research Council, the Organizing Committee, graduate and undergraduate students who made this event possible. I would also like to thank the presence of all the invited speakers, researchers, mediators, and especially for today, Marina Sanders and Professor Tiago Canecheri from the Architecture School of the UFMG will be the critical rapporteurs of the seminar after Professor Navratek's lecture. And I'd like to thank Professor Navratek as well, especially. So let us start with Marina Sanders. Bio. Marina Sanders is an architect and urbanist from UFMG and holds a master's from the graduate program in architecture and urban studies at the UFMG, where she's currently a PC candidate. And she is a researcher with the group Cosmopolis and uh, Metropolis Observatories. Thiago Canecheri is a geographer from uh, the Catholic University of Minas. He holds a master's degree in geography from Puki Minas and a PhD in postdoc at the UFMG where he is a professor of the Department of Urbanism at the School of Architecture. And I'd like to uh, welcome you all to our last day and to wish you all a great day of discussion and debate. The YouTube chat is available for you to send questions. And we have a link that's available for your certificate. Now I'm going to open the floor to Professor Daniel Medeiros Freitas, who coordinated uh, the Praxis group to present our speaker for today. Daniel, you have the floor. Thank you, Denise. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to make a quick introduction of Professor Christoph Navratek. And we've been having a research partnership over the last three years. Professor Christoph is a senior lecturer in humanities and architecture at the University of Sheffield in the UK. He is the author of the books, The City as a Political Idea, Holes in the Whole, Introduction to Urban Revolutions, and Total Urban Mobilization, Ernest Junger and the Post-Capitalist City. He is also the editor of the books Radical Inclusivity, Architecture and Urbanism, Urban Reindustrialization, and Kuala Lumpur, Community Infrastructure and Urban Inclusivity. Our current research partnership began in 2018 when Christoph first visited Belo Horizonte, carrying out research interested in the role of religion in urban spaces, especially in urban occupations. Throughout the pandemic, we, me, him, and a group of researchers from geography, sociology, and other areas, we advanced quite a bit in discussing the theoretical methodological framework, as well as conducting a series of interviews, mapping, and surveys and publications. Christoph was here for around two weeks uh, this year, and we've been developing this research. And what we've been uh, developing in our studies is the interface between urban analysis, geography, and the field of religious studies, investigating the role that the internal, external, and transcendental dimensions of religion play in the way people perceive and act in the city. It's also important to say that the research ends up discussing a whole lot of other areas related to urban planning, architecture, and a series of other interests, always with a very inclusive and generous posture from the part of Professor Christoph. So I would like to open the floor to Professor Christoph, who will speak on the theme, Urban Infrastructure in Defense of Liberal Technocracy. It's a very interesting and necessary uh, look at urban spaces. Christoph? Good to see you here. Go ahead. You have the floor. 
Okay, thank you very much uh, for this, uh, you know, very generous uh, introduction and for, uh, you know, very, very kind words. Um, my presentation, and maybe I will already start to, to share it. Uh, uh, just bear with me. And then I will I will start saying what uh, what is really about. Okay, so I hope that you see the, the whole screen. So as, as Daniel said, um, my current research and our current research that I'm, I'm doing together with Daniel and a few other colleagues uh, is on uh, religious spaces, let's put it like that. But what, what, I'm, what I'm going to talk about today, it's, uh, it's not directly related to this issue. Uh, but it's uh, it's kind of related. The the new paper, the new article that uh, should be out in the end of this week, um, on uh, that Daniel is uh, is co-author, uh, is on the uh, infrastructure of knowing in the context of uh, neo Pentecostal churches in in Brazil. Uh, so you know, watch the space. The, the article should be should be available to read uh, probably till, till the end of, of this week. But anyway, so what I'm going to, to talk about, I'm talking to, to talk about infrastructure. And um, I was thinking what I should be talking uh, for this particular event, uh, knowing what practice, practice is doing. And also, you know, being in a very privileged position of uh, speaking in the, in the kind of the end of the, this, this amazing event. And what I'm what I'm trying to do today it's a, it's a little bit provocation to be honest. So um, the the talk will try to today so space, public space, the commons, infrastructure. So infrastructure, the way how I'm sh I'm showing this and I'm presenting this is in fact in a in a contrast in public space and the commons. And I will explain this later on. As the kind of general framework, kind of intellectual framework to what we are talking about, uh, I will be talking about space in this kind of generally ge geometrical neutral sense. Um, I will be talking about place, which could be seen in a different way. You know, it depends, you know, who is talking about the space. Um, Somewhere in between or somewhere in the background, there will be idea of the void. Uh, again, in a kind of two different interpretation of Chodan and Badiou. And also somewhere else, there will be discussion about autonomy. Um, but when we talk about the space and especially the, the way how human beings are interacting with space, we can, we can take different positions, different perspectives. Uh, we can take, you know, the, this conservative Heideggerian position, which uh, was and to some extent still is pretty uh, popular and pretty present, especially in kind of Anglo-Saxon uh, architecture schools. Uh, you know, students still need to, to read uh, Building Dwelling Thinking. Um, and, you know, the, the discussion about... Even not, even if not referring to uh, to Martin Heidegger, you know, anti-Semite, Nazi, uh, that his thinking, his ideas are still present. The idea that to really be a human being, uh, you need to be sedentary. You need to kind of dwell into space. On the contrary, there is, of course, this kind of Deleuzian postmodern uh, approach with a nomadic subject. Uh, rejecting this position, very strongly being kind of anti Heideggerian. Um, and then the position that is, is close to what I'm doing and what, what I like to, to talk about is this messianic position, uh, referring to Jakob Taubes, um, that uh, is kind of trying to uh, root people in and humans in a narrative, in history, in time, and then kind of actualize themselves and their actions in space. So as I said, to what, what I'm talking about and what I'm trying to present as, in, as infrastructure, I'm trying to present it as a, a kind of opposite to public space. And of course, public space, again, is a liberal concept. Um, 
but it's at this part of li li liber liberal ideas that uh, I I think that we can question or maybe we can reject. So we, we all know uh, the whole discussion about public space that's coming from European tradition. Uh, there's an only map with the access, you know, the spaces that they are available to public and uh, spaces that they are, they are private. Um, then there's a uh, defensible space theory uh, with this uh, graduation of typology of, of private, semi-private, semi-public and public spaces. Um, this is interesting also that um, most of my students uh, are using, also architects are using this typology, but uh, funny enough, not many of them uh, know where the the idea is coming from. Not everybody are reading uh, Oscar Newman, and also they don't really understand that this particular typology or piece of theory is uh, is, is coming from a very very uh, I would even say dodgy research. That it's a, it's a just one case study with a very very problematic. Uh, uh, methodology. So it's it's kind of interesting how architecture is a one of examples, how architecture is uh, um, kind of full of ideas and theories that uh, they don't really have solid base and solid foundation. Um, when we talk about public space, you know, there's a lot of discussion about a lot of uh, um, publications and this one is a European price for the for the public space, um, and I would like to show you example, and then maybe showing this example, I will it will be easier to understand why I'm struggling, why I'm I have a problem with public space. So, this is project in uh, in Poland um, that received uh, the prize for one of the best European public space. It's a museum um, undergrad or under this uh, the surface, and then. The roof is a, is a square, is a surface. So this is uh, this this board is taken from uh, the authors of the project that uh, submit this to to the to the jury. It's it's a it's a Polish company uh, promise uh, with uh, you know the, the, the kind of the very successful Polish company, and this is how it looks like, um, and. This is, you know, I think that you should you should start to feel that there was something strange about this space. That's, you know, in a context of uh, climate emergency, making this kind of one uh, sad tree in the, you know, kind of this ocean of, you know, hard con hard surface is is really problematic. And then you see this this photograph that's showing that uh, in the context of you know, just normal weather, and you know, Poland is not Brazil, so it's not as hot, it's not as sunny. But still, even in that case, people are, you know, looking for for shadow. They are they are kind of escaping from the space designed by by architects. So the idea of the the public space as this uh, architecture intervention that's. Uh, creating something that uh, theoretically everybody can access. And this is kind of coming back to, to Noli. It becomes problematic because the, it's nice, of course, that there's uh, there an open access to the space, but it's definitely not, not enough. And then um, we have other spaces that uh, they are not necessarily public in that sense that we would like to, to talk about. So uh, it's, a, it's a public space that's for individuals. It's a space for, for being alone or kind of to, to be kind of leave me alone uh, uh, approach. And then especially in the kind of social media, uh, the last years, kind of last 15, 20 years, the public space become the the playground that it's a represented, is photographed, and it starts to be just an image. It's not really about you know what it is, but uh, you know how it's presented and reposted. In a, it's a kind of framing space for Instagram posts. Yeah, so there's another example of that. And of course, this is all coming from 
uh, from Europe or from the West. So when we just go a little bit outside Europe, and this is the research that uh, we have done in, uh, in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur, with different climate, we have very particular climatic condition, but also with a very particular religious or cultural, cultural condition, the very idea of public space start, start to be problematic and questionable. Uh, so this is from, from research we have done a few years ago. So we have been trying to understand you know, what public space means uh, in, uh, in Malaysian context. And as you see here, the most public sp space is a restaurant. We asked to define what makes a restaurant public. The answer was sitting place. And it's not stressful place where people are enjoying being there. So it's not park, it's not square, it's a restaurant, which in a, in a British context, a West European context, it's not really what we understand uh, the public space. And then further, you know, the, by the public, I mean that the common like me can enter. Usually it's an open area or enclosed area where people can see what I'm doing visible. And this is very important that people are seen. I do not think places like KTV or clubs are public spaces. Um, so as you see, then we start to question this and then the essence of, of this statement and the, the answer was like, isn't that obvious? I hang out with my friends. I don't really want to go to private spaces because it feels uncomfortable. So as you see, if you are coming from outside and read the statement, you could feel completely puzzled and it could be seen that you don't really know what I'm talking about and what this uh, uh, interview was talking about because her oral statement is coming from the religious position. You know, she, she was Muslim, she is Muslim. So the way how they are seeing public space uh, or space that is not private um, is, uh, is very deeply related to the way how they are judged by Islamic modality okay, of uh, the way how the society is perceived. So this is kind of one of example of the fact that uh, the, the very idea of public space could be, and in my, in my opinion, uh, is used as a kind of colonial concept. It's a kind of uh, impose on other cultures, other places, other religious, you know, not Western religions, not Christ Christian religions, to, uh, to force people in the to think in the way that it really doesn't matter, or it's not really connected with the way how they are thinking and how, how they are living their, their lives. What is important is a kind of digression about this research that um, the people we have been interviewing, many of them uh, have been trained and uh, have been living in the West for some time. So when we ask them about public space in London or in Cardiff or in Manchester, uh, they had no problem to, to name them. They, was, they are talking exactly about squares and you know, what uh, in, in the European West we, we see as a public space. But then the same people, we, when we ask them to describe public space in uh, in Malaysia and Kuala Lumpur, they were, as you have seen, confused. So if public space is not the answer, um, what about the commons? The commons is a concept that's a coming, you know, there's a long discussion, uh, had a negri discussion about, about the, the commonwealth. The, the commons is very, very important. I will read this. We all share and participate in, in the common. By the common, we mean, first of all, the commonwealth and the of the material world, the air, the water, the fruits of the soil and all natural bounty which is classic European political text is often claimed to be inheritance of humanity as a whole to be shared together. We consider the common also uh, and more significantly as uh, those results of social production that are necessary for social interaction and further, further, further production, such as knowledge, languages, codes, information, affects, and so forth. And this is the, the understanding of the commons as taken by many architects and used in their practice. And uh, I, will, I will see, I will, I'll show you one project uh, and I will talk about this project a little bit more in a second. But before I go there, um, I will kind of reveal my own uh, problem with the commons. Coming from Japanese uh, theoretician, Kind of post-Marxist or late-Marxist thinker Kojin Karatani, uh, 
who is talking about different modes of exchange, and he's explaining that uh, the it kind of exchange based on uh, on a gift, which is a kind of expecting reciprocity. So this is what the common is that it's uh, available, but it's a kind of constructed all the time. The the problem with this is that there was a not possibility to accumulate agents. So um, the commons are just extremely expensive concerning time and effort and engagement. The commons can't exist without people being constantly involved in reproducing this. Which again, if we talk about the language, for example, this is what we are doing, we communicate. So it's a way of living. But if the same idea is used for architecture, then I believe it becomes problematic. So very, very briefly, this is the project, uh, very interesting project done by my dear colleague, uh, Professor Doina Petrescu, who is working also in Sheffield uh, School of Architecture. It's a very successful project. Uh, it's uh, in Paris. There was the space, as you can see, that nobody really knows what to do about it. And uh, the task of the architect, this is what, uh, what Doina got to do, uh, was to propose the, the, the solution, the, the occupancy. So what could or what should happen in this place? And the way how Doina is working always is through public participation, is through uh, people being really in the, in the chair of, uh, of the design process. So it started as a you know, very broad public participation process, a pub public design process, really. And then uh, with architects helping, kind of uh, giving the expert knowledge about technology, about you know, the space and how it could work to be self-sustained uh, space. Uh, and this is also when people started to be involved and then what they what they build, what they create on the on the end as an urban garden for the community. And the biggest um, kind of benefit of this project is not really the space as such as it as it is, but the community that it was rebuilt or created during the process. So of course. My kind of hesitation about the commons, it's not about um, that it's a, it's, there was something wrong with, with this, uh, this approach and kind of uh, wrong with the commons as such. On the contrary, the, the idea that through special intervention, the community could be rebuilt or reproduced, it's amazing. And you know this project uh, proves that, that it worked. My problem is, or my question that I'm asking, that it just needs people to be there and to be involved all the time. And I'm not sure that we have energy and we have time to really do this. So as an outcome, as a, as a count proposal, I would like to suggest to think and to talk and maybe to design through infrastructure. And of course, you know, that what infrastructure is, um, it's also problematic. There was uh, quite a lot of discussion in recent years about, inf about infrastructure. There's a, a lot of very critical narratives about uh, this, uh, again, colonial, colonial project of infrastructure, kind of uh, colonial modernization or imposed mo modernization uh, that's a very, very problematic. And, and oppressive, but still I think that there is a something here that we can uh, discuss and maybe use, and maybe this is the way how our further discussion about urban spaces, that is uh, inclusive urban spaces, can, can go further. So what infrastructure is, uh, you know, I think that we all know, but it's good to, to use the, the, the definition. So uh, there was a you know, few meanings. Um, the system of public works of a country, state or region, the resources as a personal building equipment required for an activity. And I, I think that this is the most important um, part of this definition. And the second part, the under, un, underlying foundation of basic framework. 
of uh, a software system or uh, organization. So I think that this two part of definition is uh, what I would like to see as infrastructure and infrastructure, especially in a kind of urban space. So infrastructure could be seen differently in spatial. This is a anarchist project. There was a, some kind of squad that it was um, based on an agreement between uh, the squatters and uh, kind of anarchists in, in Lublin, in Polish city, and the owner of the building that uh, was not able to to, to really develop this project, uh, this building further. So the, the owner bought the, the building, but there was a kind of legal issue concerning the, the land where the building was located. So the building was just staying there uh, and not doing anything. And then local group of, of activists, they approach the, the owner and suggest we can take this and we can use it. So. It's not the commons. I think that when, when you see the, this from the perspective of the commons, um, you're kind of missing the point because there was a something already built, created, funded um, that uh, the group of people were came, they were, have been using this for three years and then they, they left. You know, there was another, another uh, photograph of that. This is kind of... Uh, cafe or restaurant so that people can get uh, food for free. Um, and then this is very interesting, very important text by, uh, by uh, you know, about uh, people in, in infra as infrastructure. This is about, about Johannesburg, but the idea is, uh, uh, is much broader. So it's about looking on social interactions, not only as a um, uh, kind of community building processes, but rather in a more kind of technical way that human interaction or interhuman interaction and people as other people can be seen technical, can be seen in a similar way than like we see when we, when we discuss, you know, roads, uh, Wi-Fi network and stuff like that. It sounds harsh, but it opens a lot of opportunities to really uh, not force people to create communities. So as uh, um, the author of the text is, uh, is kind of trying to summarize what, what it's about, the people as infrastructure notion as, as at its core acknowledges the tyranny of imposing frozen unidimensional categories on messy evolving social life and social relationships that assimilate countless processes and inheritance, ultimately rendering the search for cause and effect problematic. So I think that this is important here, that uh, it's much more open approach. It's much more um, flexible and to some extent allowing much bigger level of creative creativity in uh, urban life and in the, in the way how we as human beings, how, they, how we are living our lives. Infrastructure also could be seen uh, describing and discussing a lot of different issues. This is an amazing project done on uh, uh, infrastructure and the problem of violence against women in, uh, in India. Again, combining uh, elements of infrastructures that they are physical, elements of infrastructure that, that they are institutional, and others. But this project, that you know, it's uh, you you can find it online if you have time, and I, I strongly recommend you to to find it and to read it. It's a, it's a very good example how infrastructure could be seen can be used as a theoretical kind of intellectual framework to talk about urban space and problems of urban space. Few other examples of uh, infrastructure projects, again, going back to Kuala Lumpur, this is a project by, um, done by, by people, that activists, that they were starting to map spaces uh, where people can, can cycle in Kuala Lumpur. Kuala Lumpur is a very uh, car-oriented city. It's very unfriendly to, to pedestrians and also pretty unfriendly to, to cyclists, pretty dangerous for, for people who are cycling. 
So the project started as, uh, as a really kind of bottom-up uh, activities that uh, using existing uh, spaces, hard infrastructure, I would say, uh, they create a map where people can safely uh, cycle in the city. Later on, the project was uh, supported by the city council, and then they created, as you see, this pretty chaotic uh, uh, set set of, of cycling uh, cycling routes. Um, so it's also the kind of interesting example of uh, the bottom up project that's uh, somehow uh, taken over by the uh, by by the officials and become the kind of bottom top down uh, activities, which of course has certain consequences, some of them positive, it becomes much more broader, inclusive, some of them kind of negative that uh, when you start to um, kind of create very rigid uh, infrastructure, as you know, this kind of painted uh, pathway, then it become uh, slightly more difficult to, to use. This kind of uh, improvisation sometimes works better. But of course, infrastructure, as I mentioned before, could be seen as a very, very negative uh, uh, element of, of urban uh, development. The, the, the example of Robert Moses uh, in, from, from New York, there was a lot, a lot of discussion about that. Um, and uh, so it's not necessarily that um, it was his intention. As you see here in this, this, uh, this case, those uh, underpasses uh, that they were designed in the way that uh, public transport, public buses were not able to, to go through. And uh, one of interpretation is that it was coming from uh, his racist prejudice that uh, because the poor and mostly ethnic minorities, they were using public public transport. So he was, uh, by doing this, he was kind of preventing these people to access part of the city that he doesn't want them to, to access. So this is one of interpretation. Um, there are people who are defending him that, you know, that he was not really his intention, but whatever his intentions was, um, the, the outcome, the results is as it is. So this, buildings, this piece of infrastructure were really preventing uh, ethnic minorities and, and uh, kind of low income individuals to access particular part of the city. So what, just to try to sum, sum up uh, what, uh, what I'm talking about, that infrastructure exists beyond the community. Of course, it's created um, by forces that they are able to create uh, the infrastructure. So anybody, actors that they are in position of power. Um, and infrastructure doesn't really need community to exist. It needs institutions and users. But then the social bonds or any social bond is that infrastructure creates, uh, it's a kind of side effect. So it could be, it could be, you know, become, uh, it could create a community, it could create social bonds, but it doesn't need to. Very briefly, just to, to talk about how infrastructure could be used as a part of, of change or kind of creating a better, better world. So this is few uh, thinkers that they have been thinking beyond the capitalists. And of course, starting with Rosa Luxemburg, that, you know, uh, I think that her, her thoughts are kind of foundation uh, to, to many other people. So this is very, very remarkable quote, that capital cannot accumulate without the aid of non-capitalist organizations, nor on the other hand, can it tolerate the continued existence side by side with itself. Only the continuous and progressive disintegration of non-capitalist organizations makes accumulation of capital possible. So what she's saying that you know the capital needs the uh, something that is a not capital, that's kind of beyond capital, but at the same moment they need to devour it and des destroy it. Funny enough, Edward Glaser, uh, who is definitely mainstream American uh, economist, he's talking exactly the same 
speech, the same thought. He's uh, discussing and ev evaluating and uh, investigating so-called non-market interactions. Again, making a claim that without the something that be, exists beyond capital, beyond market, the market and capital can't exist. So if I can make this kind of massive loop here to the beginning of my talk, when I was talking about uh, messianic approach to, to discussion about space, it's kind of talking about Taubes, this is exactly the moment when this kind of transcendental perspective uh, becomes useful. And then it helps us to understand, to see infrastructure exactly as uh, something that's, uh, of course, partly embedded in our lives. But at the same moment, it has this kind of transcendental position that exists beyond our interests, beyond our activities. It just helps us. And then there's another uh, kind of Nazi thinker. So there was a Heidegger, now it's, a, it's a Karl Schmidt. Um, that this time I would like to uh, look on his, uh, his work in a slightly more positive way, um, maybe because he was really struggling with the concept of partisan. Uh, so this is his very late, um, you know, of after war, uh, Second World War work. And he really had a problem with uh, partisanship, especially this kind of left, uh, leftish revolutionaries in, uh, in uh, kind of colonial countries fighting for independence. Um, he really had a problem to understand what they are doing. And you know, definitely there was no sympathy uh, for, for, for them from, from him. But I think that you know, he, he was able to, 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 to kind of pin this down as something that uh, could be useful again for us and could be useful in the discussion of the uh, of infrastructure and urban spaces. So he defined partisanship uh, through this irregularity, increased mobility, uh, political commitment, and Tellurian defensiveness. So in general, what he's talking about, he's talking about partisanship as something that's weaker, smaller, and always more local than the occupants. Why it's important, Why how it's related to, to infrastructure? Because I, I believe that the concept of partisan shows the power of this interaction between this uh, kind of, let's say, uh, the uh, nomadic subject, us, human beings, users, and what is regular, uh, what is created, very often top-down, uh, hardcore institutions, part of built environment, which is infrastructure. And from that perspective, I would claim, this is my kind of last slide, that only by focusing on infrastructure, when we understand, when we analyze, when we talk about urban space, we can increase agents and freedom of individuals, which is exactly the essence of the liberal project. And I think that this is worth to, uh, to defend, it's worth to consider, it's uh, potentially the opening for the further discussion, what the space is. And that's it from me. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Christoph. Now I'm going to open to the comments from Thiago and Marina. Uh, I don't know what order you want to speak in. Okay, I'm going to start then. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, let's go. Well, first and foremost, I'd like to thank Praxis for the invitation so that me and Marina had this role. We talked uh, a lot after uh, every Monday of debates that we've been learning. And I think this is the merit of Praxis. Uh, once again, thank you, Denise, Danielle, and everyone for the opportunity of being the Critical Rapporteur. Before our comments, I need to make a disclaimer. I'm not an architect. I am a geographer, like Denise mentioned in my presentation, and it is from this point of view that I'll be speaking. 
of course, there's a lot of different interfaces and exchanges between architecture and geography, but I think there's a reason for my invitation. Praxis, like we've seen throughout the last few weeks, has a special attention in building transdisciplinarity. This might be the first thing that we learned in the seminar, the power of transdisciplinarity in practice. It's not just a fashionable word to put in uh, calls. Actually, we saw a bunch of different areas working together, geography, sociology, anthropology, law, political science, philosophy, among many others, interacting with architecture and urbanism. So I must say that I never felt like a fish out of water in this and other dialogues with the group. Well, those of you who saw the Praxis Seminar certainly saw a very rare phenomenon, a group that launched itself in a journey of meta-reflection and so did something very impressive and with a great rigor. The Praxis 10 Plus seminar was a kind of opening of a black box of the group's research activities. There was a lot of honesty and transparency there. Me, who I've always been very curious about the use of some refined uh, theoretical apparatuses. Well, I definitely learned a lot with the debates, and this was possible because the group was uh, able and willing to show all their advances and all their gaps. These are not the problems, but they're the conditions for any advance in knowledge. So that's the second thing I learned. The third that I learned that made it, was very clear was the connection between the different studies and works. The group studies are collective and cumulative. Every day of the seminar, by looking at it, it was very fruitful because you could see the work and the perspective so that each individual research becomes a piece of a puzzle of a larger collective investigation. This is even greater uh, than and more fruitful than looking at isolated studies. A fourth large teaching that we had was uh, summarized by Professor Denise in one of the days of the seminar, she commented on the effort to build an effective democratic confrontation. This principle that we could say is a principle, an ethical principle of research or of the university really stretched to through the whole seminar because the exchange of ideas and experiences when it's open and sincere is fundamental for a subjective transformation of each individual and of the objectiveness of social reality itself. It's not uh, by coincidence that the mediators were all from outside academia. It's important to hear representatives from the states and its different instances, representatives from social movements, representatives from those who act professionally in these areas. So stimulating this environment of alterity is not something trivial, and it must be hailed as a great contribution of this seminar. The contribution of different points of view recognizes in dialogue the possibility of doing something different from the well-worn path. So it's a transformative discourse that generates a decryption of our institutional certainties. And in this way, we can produce something new, maybe only in this way. Finally, we reach a fifth great learning of the seminar, the production of a certain critical and engaged sensibility. Critical because it pursues in a certain way, even if it's not in the group's reference, uh, at least as I, the way I see it, it pursues a certain negativity engaged because it also assumes a posture of producing knowledge as a kind of struggle, combat in Bordeaux's terms. This is a kind of knowledge that wants to produce new worlds. The group's critical posture, because it is negative, is necessarily combined with a propositional approach. Why? Because it seeks to build alternatives. The practice of research, study, and outreach of praxis has a double movement. First, deconstruction and criticism of certain ideas and practices which are consolidated in contemporary urban world. On the other hand, we have a willingness to construct and incorporate new ideas and practices to the repertoire of architecture, urbanism, and social criticism. 
and going beyond the reach of critical thought and sharpening thoughts that have become stale in the group there's an effort of reconfiguring the role of architects and public power and technical uh, consultancies and others In the field of architecture and social uh, action, this is the fuel that mobilizes praxis to keep its own praxis in movement. Forgive me for the repetitive tautology, but it's necessary here because the group's name reveals what it carries in its essence. At the same time, the group is not afraid of running risks, of talking about clearly it's um, underpinnings, doesn't shy away from elaborations, um, but goes to the limit and informs in its in the limit er, uh, provocations to the areas of urban design and architecture. Praxis presents this approach, which is important. Um, combining the idea of reading the place with the perspective of decryption of power developed by Sanin Restrepo. And from there, we arrive at a radical critique. After all, it's trying to build knowledge that is engaged. The contributions that were presented to the seminar contribute effectively to reveal the limits and contradictions of an ordering of the space, which is dominated by capitalist uh, organizations and which appropriates discourses of the agents who act in different domains of the city. Starting from the ass assumption that the urban space is both a structured and structuring medium, the group seeks to demonstrate that in the daily practice of individuals, the urban space is formed by a set of informations, be they cultural, environmental, technical, or political. And this guides both the structural dimensions of society and individual decisions. This gives support to the geometry of power, which segregates the public space that transforms or more precisely um, reduces the spa spaces as a mere form of accumulation of capital. Um, we approach the question of city architecture and politics in a Borromean loop in which none of these three terms appears alone. They are sustained as a necessary triad so that this group's praxis does not become unfe unfeasible. This three-part reflection guarantees the means to think about the description, not only of the city, and of the, but also the, the systems of exclusion that permeate our society, but also the architects on practice. Maybe this is the 
meaning, the, the deeper meaning of the idea of occupying a political space. From uh, engaged intervention, architecture may broaden the inclusion of those who are excluded. In this sense, we can conceive of architecture as a means and not an ends, a means for the construction of the political, a means for the exercise of the political, as was our the second name of uh, the day of our second name of debate. Of course, there are contradictions. As Bruno Lima showed, violence, whether it's immediate violence or structural or symbolic violence, that perpasses the whole of the urban space and is organized in language games that try to block the uh, underdogs from their participation in, the poli in politics. This is of course a great challenge to us, but we insist, we persist. There's also, there was um, in a certain way, a consensus of participation. There was an idea of a Habermasian communicative action would be able to build pol politics. Thais Nassifi, um, show the limits of this conception in her master's work. It doesn't, this doesn't mean that communication must be thrown out. In this way, Thais showed an exercise of rebuilding a form of insertion in this political sphere, in this public sphere, um, by presenting the idea of the urban and critical discussions. Therefore, through interactional experiences, it would be able, it would be possible to build a sensible connection and in which political discourses can interact and create the new. Following, Karimina Almeida thinks about a critique of contemporary processes of space production marked by the reproduction of inequality and exclusion. It's important to, it's necessary to understand the inefficiency of some public policies and propose new approaches to understand territories and the building of urban spaces. If comparison is possible, the result of this group approach offers a privileged point of view for the facing of our reality. Through a view on the city, the theme of our fourth day of debates, through the prism of the reading of plays and the description of power, paying attention to agents, practices, and discourses, we had the possibility of perception of various blind fields that form our urban experience we discuss the production of new spaces. For example, when Pedro Ferreira discussed Airbnb, Renata Salles, um, on the, on, in her turn, offers an approach that dislocates the point of view of how we see urban territories um, that are organized in urban occupations. In the city of Tom Timóteo, she wanted to develop a new form of action in design. This uh, attempt to develop a new view uh, was in Lydia Collins' work. She discussed practices that sh show up in different areas of the city of Belo Horizonte, thinking about form possibilities of challenging uh, the segregation, so overcoming segregation with open cities. Some of the spaces that she finds in Belo Horizonte that stimulates open cities um, allow for planning for fluidity. Thinking of viewing the city is um, is also about 
uh, in a context of neoliberal hegemony, thinking of public spaces is maybe essential so we can understand the current context. In this manner, Tarcísio Gontijo Cunha carries out his research. Faced with a wall of the neoliberal consensus, he tries to identify fissures in public space where he is able to overcome the limits of this public space. Um, this wall seems to be more and more difficult to, to be challenged. Danielle showed this in the big urban projects. Agents who are larger and larger through the gigantic urban projects transform these the urban public spaces. Danielle's, for, Danielle's research uh, is, was complemented post-2016 context uh, with, at the same time, the economic problems of post-pandemic, and but also a strengthening of the neoliberal the neoliberal recipe book, which has been more disseminated, especially in Brazil post the coup d'etat against Dilma Rousseff. So he shows how this is more and more difficult to challenge. Um, Marina will compliment me, but I think it's clear that this is proof of pertinence and relevance of the production of Praxis, the Praxis Research Group, critical, engaged reflection and practice aimed at overcoming the current state of affairs. As I have already mentioned, the name of the group could not be more appropriate. Before I give Marina the next, the floor, I would like to say that this seminar was a great reflection. For many, the the different presentations build and join forces to the advances. This was a lot of hard work of a group that knows about its commitment to the exercise of the political. Thank you, Marina. It's over to you now. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Hi, everyone. I'd like to compliment a bit of Thiago's folk. It's a little hard to comment on the presentations. I don't feel like I have that much of an, uh, that authority. So I'll try to focus on commenting a little of the lessons learned. But I, there were so many lessons learned. This was fantastic. But, uh, some of the impressions of the contact of the group with the group that I've been experiencing since my undergrad days, that praxis was always very, uh, always had a very important position, and especially Professor Denise with a very critical and fighting. Uh, approach, an approach committed to the struggles. I was super honored to know, I had the privilege of knowing a lot of the researchers to talk along the corridors. We learn a lot in our university days, in casual conversations. Some people who were a part of the group, but um, but are not um, anymore. I've been in the architecture school for 10 years now between undergrad and grad school. You know, it's a long time, it's amazing. But these are people who I've shared a lot of issues on life. Um, the idea of being life as a researcher, uh, the life, the idea of being engaged in the construction of public policies, 
I had the pleasure um, of seeing events, accessing reports, which are always a source of very relevant information. When we need data, there's always amazing data. We, it's really important to mention the incredible data production that Praxis puts out. If we look at the website, it's a great example of this attempt to publicize um, really concerned with the communication of the research carried out to society. I think we really have to uh, value this because we know it's not trivial to do science communication. It's never been, it's praxis has always faced this challenge and stepped up to the challenge. Um, a few points that, um, specifically that affect me more in, in my path. I think one of the biggest milestones for me, um, I joined the group in 2010, I, was to come into contact with the whole debate around the newly created My House, My Life governmental program. How much we struggled as students to analyze the program and propose other design solutions. I did a course with Denise and Marcella. At the time, Marcella was a teaching in, intern, so I had this contact with this group that was there. Also, other students and researchers criticizing the policy, but also thinking inside and outside the classroom in propositions. So we were not only critiquing, but also advancing with and and analyzing the political, economic, spatial, and architectural determinants that existed, all the limitations, and trying to propose on top of that, overcoming the state, overcoming public policy, but also entering a dialogue with it and proposing and designing. About this um, idea of the Projecting Places project, for me, this clearly marked when I think about the teaching of architecture that I had access to because of the perspective of praxis, this mode of thinking based on diagrams, which was presented by Carolina, was very determining. And certainly the reflection about housing as a pro process, the support, the feeling, the determinations, the indetermination as Rodrigo brought us, that we need to think about every time we are going to design. So as we've been building this group, we've been thinking about a capacity to not only make new buildings and looking at all the attributes of the place and using the dimension, this diagrammatical uh, approach, for instance, but we can think of how we can interact with the city as it exists with the legislation as Maura mentioned as well. That's something that we see in the initiative of Marcella's PFLEX initiative, thinking about housing in downtown areas in the center of the city. So I see all these possibilities of action that we have, and this makes it so that we think that architecture is not just a, a, an isolated apparatus. And when we're students, for instance, this is very instigating to deal with the determinations that come from reality. Certainly this uh, ends up educating a different kind of professional, a professional that's aware and prepared to deal with the real city or at least to be interested in the real city. And I think this really marked my uh, education. And it's hard for us to think of projects in a, in a different way because it really influenced my education that of many people i mean i don't work with architecture design but i feel that it is in me somehow i believe that it's in the life of many people who went through praxis this idea that once your mind expands and never shrinks back to its original size i think this way of thinking of design once you get into it you can never accept less than that so I think that this sensibilization that Praxis proposes is really fundamental in our education. Another issue that impressed me a lot beyond this dimension of criticizing and dialoguing with public policy was this interaction with the universe of housing, of popular housing, the so-called informal city that is 
studied by Praxis that Praxis brings it into the school of architecture. So making a counterpoint to the Mia uh, Casa Mia Vida public program, the housing program, uh, we had urban occupations here, a phenomenon that are opposite to the inst institutionalized forms of producing social high housing. And there again, Praxis is there. Praxis uh, has had a variety of different publications produced about and with these territories. So we have reports that systematize the data. Uh, Praxis and Denise, Rafael Bittencourt, Marcela were there. So for me, there's no way to not have this reference whenever I think of Praxis. So beyond uh, urban occupation themselves, when we think of this space of the informal city, between many quotation marks, once again, Praxis is there in many different ways, understanding how the city works beyond its visible shell or beyond the architecture, the so-called precariousness, as Juliana says, seeing the agencies, the processes, the land and housing markets, as Gustavo Cirillo did, and as Luciana said, and maybe they were some of the first people to study this in depth in Belo Horizonte is a huge contribution. Beyond that, there's also a concern in recognizing housing connected with other uses. After all, if that's the way it is in the formal city, it's even more like that in the popular city where housing is also a part of the family economy and mixed use is essential. This is what Pedro analyzes. It's essential for survival, for prosperity, for income generation. And Pedro, when he talks about this, when talk, he also talks about public policies and its bottlenecks as it interacts with popular territories, oftentimes disregarding the importance of mixed use for these territories. And I'd like to remind you also that we have this very important production coming from Praxis about evictions in villas and favelas which is a report on evictions with data collected together with the rebel and they were systematized in a way that we can't find anywhere else. So I'd like to bring an opportunity to really uh, praise. praise this work, constant work by, by practice. So we have research and commitment with the popular informal city, so to speak, understanding the processes of the city, the interaction of the state with the city in short, many important productions. So just to close everything, inverting a little bit the order of the days of the seminar, I think Chago managed to encompass that. I think it's worthwhile just to comment on the issue of looking at the city and building knowledge. And I think this is where some of the greatest challenges reside. This is where we make this meta reflection, as Thiago taught me. When we look at the city in the perspective that you're showing here, we recognize the agents of the city, the practices of the city, the processes, and we try to understand in the most committed way possible this, uh, the issues of this reality. So in this sense, I think it's very important to value and congratulate Praxis for this effort of always renewing your theoretical arsenal, working in dialogue with several areas of knowledge. As Chago mentioned, we had law with Bruno, anthropology with Hinata, always updating perspectives and keeping an eye on what's going on current all the time. So I think this is a very committed group, committed to this uh, pulsating living entity. And so building knowledge through and from these spaces is fundamental to think about the role of architecture as a field of knowledge and field of production of the city in a critical and committed way. And we saw this here with Amida, and it seems like Amida has a very interesting work that's very close to what Praxis makes, both in this meta reflection and commitment to the territories that are under study. Uh, that seems that you're bringing, seeking an architecture that recognizes the limits of the official language of the architect and is engaged in trying to go beyond these limits because these knowledges that are being built, they challenge the disciplinary devices of architecture as Jerusa showed us precisely because they are committed to a performance that is interested, first of all, with the margins, as Juliana said, 
I admire both of them very much. I've been learning a lot whenever I can interact with the work for Juliana Jerusa, both in architecture and outside, thinking about alternatives for technical assistance ever since 2018 with Juliana Jerusa, for instance, and more recently with Marcela in the Housing Council. Marcela has been struggling a lot to try and bring this debate to politics, to housing policies. Marcela is another teacher, master of mine, a person I greatly admire for her work and dedication, concerned with building this kind of knowledge with and not about the peripheral areas, the marginal areas, recognizing that this is a process full of uncertainties, controversies, and contingencies, and still never giving up. So finally, I'm sorry I said so much, but for being part of my education and influencing so many people, bringing contradiction into practice and not trying to omit this contradiction, but making it the subject of reflection and proposition. I have to thank this group, congratulate you all. You are an inspiration to us. May many successful years come ahead of you and thank you for the opportunity to be here and learn with you. I hope that me and Chago were able to play this role of being critical rapporteurs and trying to look at generally what happened. Thank you so much, Denise, for the opportunity. Marina and Thiago. Thiago, if you can open your camera, please. Thank you. Well, I'd like to comment on something to you. When we were organizing the seminar, I told the commission that, uh, which is made up of me, Daniel, Bruno, Tarciso, and Jerusa, I mentioned an, a need that I had more than others of l hearing people who are far from the group. Even though you are very close to the group, I mean, we know each other, we're friends, Marina was my student. Well, you were never uh, inside the group. So I wanted to hear people who were not part of our day-to-day -day work because it was interesting to me to know a critical outlook about what was good and what was bad in the group. And so when you bring these very kind and generous words, extremely generous words, I'm very happy not only... Don't understand me wrong here. It's not just for the recognition, uh, van, vain recognition. Of course, I'm very happy to assume this vanity to hear this. But in the sense of, well, you understood some of the assumptions that are innegotiable to us, which is honesty in research, for instance, rigor in our research and the publicization of our research. We are in a public university that works tirelessly to be diverse, to be free and public. So it's our obligation, our duty to work inside these assumptions. And this concern was mine in the sense of knowing whether are we being honest, rigorous, and transparent in public? That's what I wanted to hear uh, from people who are not part of our day-to-day -day world so that we didn't run the risk of not being honest, rigorous, public, etc. So in such hard times that we're living in, we Brazilians are going through unreal, surreal times. I think it's important to listen to each other. And I can only thank you for your generosity in listening to us, participating with us, and contributing with so many good, generous remarks. Sincerely, I didn't expect this. I expected that we would get more criticisms in the sense you should improve this or that, something in that sense. So I'm very happy with the recognition. I'll take on this recognition in my vain side of we all have some vanity, right? But 
uh, in the times that we're living in, I'm very happy in listening and hearing that what we do is successful in a certain way. And that's why we are in the university. We have the duty of producing knowledge in the horizon of trying to contribute to the world, a world that's less unequal and that's fairer and more just. So I'd like to thank you immensely, both of you. It was a huge pleasure to be here all, every day with you and to hear your words. Thank you very much. And um, now, Danielle prepared two questions for Christoph. But I'd like to follow my thank you to Marina and Thiago in, in face of what they mentioned and follow with uh, my huge thanks to Christoph, who's been a partner for many years in research and friendship, a partnership that is very important to us, it's not just in terms of work, but personally, and I'd also like to uh, add a question to you beyond my thanks. <clears throat> there is one issue that Marina and Thiago raised about our, our investment, abs an absurd investment due to trying to produce, a, creating a methodology, a work methodology that is transdisciplinary, that doesn't only speak to architecture, because that's why we call Tiago, he's a geographer. We're interested in talking to other fields. So we've heavily invested in creating methodology, work methodologies, which are transdisciplinary, which can produce another logic of the practice in the city. This has been our objective maybe since, this, this has always been very difficult since the coup d'etat against Dilma Rousseff, um, both Thiago and Marina mentioned this, I feel like there's a small contradiction with what you're saying. It doesn't mean that you're right or you're right, um, we're right or you're right. But I'd like you to um, position yourself in terms of this contradiction that I noticed. Our investment has been in the direction of trying to bring the dwellers as participants, as active participants in the decision-making processes in the city and disconnect uh, them from the imposition by institutions. Like you, we believe that infrastructure for people has been um, not given enough attention versus an infrastructure directed at things. But our investment has been in the sense of creating possibilities of a, an infrastructure with people. It doesn't mean that we're working within the participatory model, community model. Um, uh, this, this model uh, has reached its limit and we have stories to, to tell on how this participatory model has, has uh, met. But what we're bringing is, is an inversion of a logic. It goes well beyond this pretense of participation. In fact, infrastructure does not depend on the community to exist. However, 
my question is, how can we assure, ensure that the social relations will exist if they are not assumptions of a theoretical and methodological approach for the creation of the city. It bothers me that uh, the, the institutional force that you place bothers me. And this is maybe our contradiction in terms of what you, you, you have put forth. Our strength has been mobilized towards the, the city dwellers and not institutions. This was a point that Marina Chabo. So we can have this discussion and then Danielle will ask his questions that were brought forth here. Thank you. We'll, we'll... Christoph, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. And again, I'm absolutely in love with praxis. You know, this is my disclaimer. I, I, I really believe, you know, that the people that they are there are absolutely amazing. The intellectual contribution that, that you are producing is uh, is mind blowing. So, you know, I'm I'm just honored that uh, you kind of consider me as your, your, your friend and I can work with you. It's, uh, uh, you know, it's a massive, massive pleasure. Uh, so, but to, to answer your question, as I said, my, my talk was a little bit provocation and especially, I, I, you know, I, I was hoping to a little bit poke you. But uh, in fact, um, what I was trying to, to say, and there was a connection between your question and uh, Daniel's question, I think, the first Daniel's question, that uh, I think that thinking through infrastructure um, allows us to be uh, even more modest. And I, I think that, you know, when, when, I, when I know you, when I know what, what practice is doing, I think that this, uh, this modesty, this self-reflection, um, this uh, kind of attempt not to impose anything on, on people you are working with, uh, it's, a, it's a very, very important ethical dimension of what, what you're doing. And I think that, you know, when we think about space, urban spaces through the, the perspective of this kind of messianic infrastructure, uh, it, it will show, help us to, to be modest because it, it kind of show us that whatever we are going to help people to create, uh, we are kind of losing control over this uh, just a moment when it's, it's, it's built. Uh, or it's created if we are talking about social infrastructure. This is what we can't control. This is controlled by new people, that new people are coming, uh, you know, we will live, we will die at some point, but many stuff that, you know, you have produced and we are producing will stay there. So from, from my perspective, talking about infrastructure and thinking through infrastructure about urban space is exactly about, um, it's not contradictory what, what you are saying, because this is ethical project for now uh, to mobilize people, uh, to help them, you know, for them to, to help themselves. And, you know, our role, your role is really as a kind of facilitator of this uh, mobilization and, and processes. But as I said, you know, it kind of put us even in a, in a weaker position in the sense that, uh, you know, anything that is going beyond what we produce in the very moment it's produced, it doesn't belong to us. It's out there. And then our goal is to kind of go back to this and to try to reinterpret it. So the work of, of us is about this kind of learning ourselves and help, helping other people to learn skills, how to reinterpret something that's uh, always beyond our reach. Yeah, so to me, this is the connection be between infrastructure and uh, this kind of messianic perspective in, uh, in this very deep, ethical, inclusive, inclusive way. I hope it makes sense.
Daniel, Christoph. I uh, sent you the questions. I'd like to uh, discuss these the question between the the connection between the messianic approach and the power project. My second question, I'm very interested in it, is about the concept of place. You bring this uh, idea from phenomenology and then, then through the concept of Massey and then coming to a con Taub's concept. So I'd like you to tell me a little more about the idea of concept of place that's closer to Taub's concept and what it is what is its potential dialogue with the way of designing urban spaces? And in this perspective, I'd like you to speak a little more about the void uh, in opposition to the concept of place, it seems, in this new theoretical framework you present. Um, so for the first question, I, I kind of partly I think I, I, I answer. Um, just to add few 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 sentences uh, on on top of that, uh, of course, infrastructure is by definition is a power project, uh, and I think that you know, if we ever have an occasion, an opportunity to to be in a position of power, really, uh, to work with uh, you know uh, local governments and be able to to in uh, kind of instigate the, the infrastructure projects, um, it's good to remind ourselves exactly this, that it's a power project. So there was, there was a, always a risk that we are hurting people. Uh, and then the, what, what I was talking about before, the, the ability to make an infrastructure as open as possible and to work on different methods of reinterpretation of infrastructure. This is what uh, this is a kind of ethical uh, challenge that, that we are facing. So yeah, the, it, it is what it, what it is. I'm, I'm just saying that, um, and I understand your, your position, uh, you know, working with uh, marginalized community, with occupied territories, that to some extent uh, the uh, kind of the government is always uh, out there in its potential, uh, uh, maybe not enemy, but uh, there was definitely a tension. I'm just saying that, you know, there could be a chance, that could be a moment uh, when you will be in a position of power, uh, but then the same approach should, uh, should remain. Okay. Concerning the, the place, I would like to start with the void because I, I haven't, talk, I just mentioned this, but I haven't been developing this, this concept uh, further. Um, the void that I'm using, it is kind of coming from, from two different theoretical sources. One is Alain Badiou. Um, when, uh, when he's talking about the void, he's talking about the power that is not represented, that it exists, but it's not represented. So it's about expanding the real, kind of allowing this unrepresented, unrepresented force to enter to the, to the public real. The other approach to the void uh, is from you know, a very controversial person or thinker, Emil Chiodan, uh, who was on this kind of far right uh, Romanian before before Second World War? He was a friend of Michel Yade. Um, very very weird person, um, but he was talking about the void as um, as a break, and I think that this is something very very important because um, when we talk. And this is what you know. Sorry for you know a lot of digressions. Uh, Denise uh, mentioned this kind of transdisciplinary uh, approach to work, and you know I think you know I'm I still uh, I admire what you are doing. I'm kind of trying in my work to to be like you. You know, kind of when I grew up, I would like to be like Denise. Um, so this thinking uh, with people, uh, talking with people, especially kind of political sciences or people been engaged with in the kind of um, sociological stu the studies, very often they, they don't see the, the void, they don't see the break 
for them, there's uh, uh, connections everywhere. But we as architects, as people who are working in space, we know that uh, space is granular, that uh, exactly because the, the nature of space, uh, a lot of different actions and activities could happen at the same time. So, you know, in, uh, in the same building, uh, you can have, uh, you know, the chapel or, and then the kind of nightclub, if there was a kind of proper isolation, you know, you can imagine completely separate uh, contradictory functions and then programs and activities that they are happening very close to each other. And this is what, what architects are dealing with, that we, uh, we know that the break, the void, is, is extremely important. It's, extremely, it's a fundamental, really, to what, what we do. And this is, you know, kind of going back to the idea of, of space or place. You know, I have problem with place, as you, as you know, um, that uh, the, the place coming from phenomenological tradition, kind of heavily uh, influenced by Heideggerian thinking. I'm pretty sure that uh, we can make a reinterpretation. You know, Salah Ahmad is, is doing very interesting feminist inter reinterpretation of phenomenology. phenomenology. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that, you know, there is definitely the, the pathway to follow this route, uh, to completely ditch Heidegger and, and go uh, in, a, in a much, much nicer places with her and with, with thinkers like, like, like her. Um, but to, to me, the, the, the space is more the construct. So um, I, I'm, I'm a little bit afraid of this kind of essentialist uh, attribute of, of the idea of place. So as, as far as possible, I'm trying to avoid place and I'm trying as, as a concept, as a notion, I'm rather talking about you know, constructed space, uh, constructed networks, infrastructure and void, exactly the break that's allowing different people to exist close to each other and not necessarily becoming community. This is, you know, as I, as I mentioned before, related to this idea of infrastructure and also, you know, uh, what Ab Abdul Sim Simon uh, is talking about, uh, about people as infrastructure, that uh, allowing us not to be part of community, uh, but also allowing us to create community, to create bonds, different type of bonds, uh, different type of, of social interactions. This is important. Uh, and this is something that potentially gives us as human beings agency and also kind of secure our freedom. I hope it makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. Then easy. Well, uh, I just like to say I will make a brief comment, Christoph, in relation to transdisciplinarity, and I think this has to do with my comment from before, which might seem like a contradiction. After what you said, I don't think it is a contradiction, but I still think they are two different paths, not necessarily contradictory, but they are two paths that have distinct entries, which is, well, I, I learned about transdisciplinarity. This seminar is part of our activities there in our department. And I think it's a very simple concept, but at the same time, very complex because it says we need to be transdisciplinary. It means we have to not be attached to that which constitutes us not in relation to um, 
we can't detach from what we know, but detach from what gives us power in relation, for example, to our instruments, categories, ind indexes, that which gives us our power, technical design in the case of architecture. That's one of the things in architecture that gives us power. But part of that is opening to that which we don't know, opening ourselves to the unpredictable. And who wants to do that? That's the issue. Who is willing to do this? I think I mentioned this at some point in the seminar. Who is willing to give up that which gives them power, safety? We had a conversation with two of our partners from the mayor's office who, beyond anything, they are good friends of ours, uh, Bell and Gisela. And they asked us, what do you recommend us to do as institutions? Because maybe that's what makes me a, a, a little bit uncomfortable in relation to this institutional strength. And this reminds me of what we're seeing today, which is the possibility of mining happening in our Serra do Curral. I think you remember this, this mountain range in Belo Horizonte where we have the configuration of a deliberation council in which the majority of this council, this board comes from the executive power. How is it that we can transform any political decision inside a political structure in which the majority defines its own politics, there's no way to change this process. There's no way. So the sort of institutional strength given to the state in the definition of whatever, this is what bothers me. Of course, uh, I don't have the intent of trying to define the capitalist modes of production and that's not our, our role I, I don't have we're not here to try and see the world in another mode of production or to be able to transform that that's beyond our power but creating cities which have to something to do with what john holloway mentioned which are fissures in capitalism gaps in capitalism so that we can have residents come in and tell us what kind of infrastructure do they want us to design? What kind of infrastructures could be based on what they understand as a place? And then the place, not in a phenomenological approach. You know that I go against this sort of phenomenological approach that, oh, we're uh, comes in as a savior. But in the sense of the day-to-day -day life, of the place, this is the kind of concept that we use uh, for place in our work. Listening to the residents so they can tell the state, they can tell to architects, they can tell to boards, councils, or whatever it may be, any sort of deliberation body, any sort of body with power, what they want, what they need, that's not what's being done. How do we change this process? Political struggle. That's the way we do it. It's only through struggle. That's what we've been fighting to go against the understanding of the state that mining in the hills above Belo Horizonte is the best thing that can happen to the city of Belo Horizonte. Are we going to be able to stop that? I don't know, but at the very least, we were able to cause a certain amount of uh, uh, awareness and uh, of, of people not being comfortable with this in the population. And this is a great advance in Brazil, just making people uncomfortable. I'm not sure we're going to be stop, we're, we're stopping mining in the Serra do Corral. This is just an example. But this sort of... What? The sort of discomfort is a very micro thing, but this is what we're able to achieve and what we want to do. Wow. Residents need to fight. They need to scream. They need to go to the combat field and say, we don't want this. 
this is impossible. So we are in micro politics without the pretension of changing macro global structures. I mean, we're very far from that. But this kind of institutional strength, this is what bothers me. So I, I don't think it's a contradiction, but it's another point of entry, let's say. Can, can I respond to this? Um, I think that I, and of course I understand you know, where, where you are coming from. I, I would like to, to show the, the kind of paradox of the, the, of the situation and uh, maybe it will kind of explain a little bit more um, kind of my, my position. So if we, if we ask residents what kind of infrastructure they, they want, First of all, there is a problem with defining residents. So defining the public. There is no one public. There are many publics. And you know, as, as you know, uh, there's exactly the struggle there. And very often, uh, it depends how we approach and who we are going to approach, then these voices we are going to amplify. You know, the kind of hegemonic institutional power we will approach people mostly to listen to their leaders yeah so they are listening to power uh, they are not really interested in you know kind of marginalized community they they're interested as power deal deals with power if you know you are approaching or i was approaching people uh, then we have been looking for people marginalized that people that are not in power and then we try to amplify their voices but of course, you know, ethically, I, I believe that our approach is, is better, uh, but it's again, it's a, just, just a part of, of the whole story. It's still the kind of fragment of, of the picture. But there was an even bigger problem that I, I'm, I'm finding here, that maybe in this particular moment, uh, the public will tell us, this is what we want. But what is going to be created it's going to stay. This is the, the, the nature of infrastructure projects, especially kind of built infrastructure. It stays for years. So it means that people who, ex could, who define what they want, they will be gone. Uh, they will not live in this place anymore. They will die. There will be new generation. They, you know, incomers, migrants. Uh, and then we never listen to these people. Uh, because you know they are not here yet. So this is what, what I was also trying to say in the beginning, that uh, the kind of thinking through infrastructure um, should make us humble, should make us really aware of that, that uh, there's, a, there's a risk that we will never do what we try to achieve. We'll never be able to listen to people who, who will be using stuff that is going to be created. And I'm not saying this to, to say, okay, so because of that, let's don't do anything. Uh, I'm just saying that it puts us in a, in a position of kind of good doers and, and failing people always, but we still should do this. So I still believe that we should engage with what we are doing, if you can engage with uh, uh, you know, institutional power, we should do this and we should try as much as we can to achieve it. The, 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 the case that you are talking about, uh, again, it's, uh, I would kind of defend your position or kind of criticize this project exactly from the infrastructure perspective, yeah? because it's a very local, very um, kind of um, narrow-minded idea and project that, of course, for some people, for some group, and for some time, it will be beneficial, but in a broader context, also broad context, in a, if you are talking about time, it will be catastrophic. So as an infrastructure project, it's a wrong project. Okay? But I, as I said, I think that I can, I can stand with you on the same barricade, but coming from kind of slightly different ideological position.
Yeah, yeah, th that's it. I think that we're together, but we're separate, right? <laughs> no, I understand you. And I think that we have something great. We have a lot of topics to ahead of us, and we'll be talking for a long time to come. But I don't want to privatize our discussion. I wanted to open this to Marina and Thiago and Danielle. Do you want to comment on anything? Please go ahead. Don't you want to talk? <clears throat> I think it's fine. I think it's great. Just to. Just one more little provocation before we stop off. I can't, I can't uh, lose this opportunity, miss this opportunity. That's why we work with this, the assumption of projects that <coughs> make these infrastructures always mutable, transformable, a long time. That is an I our assumption of design so that this transformation occurs through time that's another discussion but that was here in our discussion in our seminar especially in our discussion with rodrigo maura projecting places the day where we had that theme um this was brought to our seminar well I think there are no more questions in the chat box. Let me check. I would like to close by thanking once again, I can't stop thanking you. Uh, my gratitude uh, to the generosity of Tiago and Marina and also for the participation today of Professor Christoph, and to say that this is our final day and we're organizing a volume that brings together all the work that was presented here, the talks, the lectures of our international speakers, and there, um, there will be a paper that I did not present in the seminar, but that speaks about the links between the group theory and methodology. It was my decision not to give this talk for uh, several reasons, especially because these links are a part of, um, of the work that I'm going to present in my um, promotion, in my university career, but this will appear in the volume organized by the group. The volume will be launched in the IE, IEAT seminar um, in July, on July 20th, we're working to 28th, I apologize. Um, when there will be an annual seminar by our Institute of Architecture and the local researchers and also the research groups that are being received by IAT, and we will launch this volume. Danielle, would you like to comment something? No, Denise, I would just like to thank everyone, everyone. I'm not even going to mention names. I'm just going to say everyone. We had an average of 200 to 250 people watching and visualizations, um, which is a really great number. It's very important to us. So I'd like Flavio and... Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank our interpreters. I'd like to ask you to stay just for a little bit so we can take a picture. Flavio, you, you can stop transmission. Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for following along, for watching us being here.